just introduce the kind of range of uh, bits that are in, in my life bit. And anyway, uh, hopefully enough to get us kicked off on the, the topic here. But, Gord, could you give us a sense of, this is now 10 years of collecting data. How much data have you collected? And how, how what, what, I'm curious about what you found in terms of the way that you could use the data and whether you've been able, whether, whether that you're thinking about how the data is useful has changed from your original conception to what, the way you look at it there. Well, I, as we move, move through uh, uh, this whole period, what, what I'm sort of coming to realize is that uh, the main thing that it provides is a great, I'll say, I won't say, maybe a smugness about, gee, my data is there, I don't have to remember it, and uh, that it, it's a clutter reducer and I can now work anywhere. In fact, I work about half time in Australia. So all I do is put my, my, my laptop in the, in the suitcase and I'm off. And so all of the things that would have been paper and files and things like that are, are now part of this, this, this ground truth memory. So uh, the, uh, I think that's been the main effect. It's just a, a nice feeling that you got that all of this is there. You're, I don't spend a lot of time rifling through, oh, what did that have to do or something like that? Because it's, it's, it's written down some, somewhere and, uh, and I can find it. Um, you, know, every, you know, every day, it, you know, there's some weird discovery that I made <coughs> by, uh, just in the process of looking for something else. But uh, like most of us in this room, I think we're, our, what we're dealing with is all of the presentations, all of the books, all of the uh, emails, uh, the, the Facebooks, all of the communication, and, and you, we need to retain that. Uh, that's where, where the gain is. Uh, basically, I, you know, I won't say I've ever lost anything, but uh, in general, uh, there's, there's some, by hook or by crook, I'll, I'll, I'm able to find, find an item if it's, if it's in there. Um, I think the, uh, the, the big gain for me is just having this rec all these records, records there. And the fact, you know, the fact, fact that I wish these books were all electronic at this point. I mean, this is on, this is on, uh, on Kindle, of course. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, I have, I have encoded about 250 books, so all my, a lot of the technical books I had, uh, had scanned uh, archive.org had them, and, and that's now that's more and more prevalent. And the reason I want it, I want them on my, on my in my search space is that if I've ever looked at that, then that's something that's very familiar, and I can tie it into my my own bio memory. In fact, the way I regard that memory is that's ground truth, and my bio memory is the URLs and enough metadata to find something in the, in, uh, the real memory. So I think my hard drive is, is real memory and the other one is just uh, pointers into that and indexes in, into that. And uh, you know, so there's all kinds of things when you say, oh, there's so much information, what do you do about this or that? And, and uh, I say we construct as many clues as we can called metadata about every, anything or everything, so you can you can retrieve it. So, um, Guido, I'm curious as a, as a VC, if you look at the, what what Gordon's been doing here, do you see the potential for for big businesses, for large large opportunities um, in this uh, in this marketplace? If you feel like helpful. Yeah, I think I absolutely do. I mean, uh, I think first of all, there's a huge user base here, right? There's pretty much every modern information worker suffers from information overload and there's lots of things that you like to get off your brain and, and that's right. to put somewhere. And I think that the cloud is, is uh, clearly um, um, the right, right place to put it. Um, I think there's still, you know, I think it's still early days in a sense for, for companies, but I think we're seeing, we're starting to see some, some initial successes, you know, where, where companies are starting to scale to millions of users, you know, that, that are, uh, where companies are not only Storing information, but starting to, to automatically extract metadata, uh, annotate this information, really really make it useful um, 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 for people. So, so when you say some successes, successes, are you, what do you think of that? I mean, the, the, for me personally, um, what, what really got me into um, 
uh, uh, starting to, to put my, my brain online. I think the first thing was uh, uh, Amazon S3, which was you know sort of a cheap cheap storage service. So suddenly you could you have a service that was reliable, could put lots of data there. The, the thing that really got me hooked was Evernote, uh, mm. which which really helped me to go paperless. So it's, it's maybe you could explain a little bit because sure. Sure. Let, let me, what Evernote so, is. so Evernote it's a, it's a simple application. You basically have a little notebook app on your computer or on your iPhone, runs on, on a bunch of platforms. And what you can do is you can capture information. You can, for example, type a note, and they get sent to all these different places. But, but more importantly, it also will index it um, on the server and then put, uh, download that index back to you, for example, on the MacBook. So if I do a desktop search on the MacBook, I can now search all of my Evernote notes. So, so far, this is not very useful. I, mean, it was just, this kind of, I could just type a note locally and it would make a difference. Um, where, where, what really sort of changed the game for me is, is you know, that, that one day I scanned the document. Actually, I didn't really read the documentation. I scanned the document, uh, put it into Evernote, ran a search, and it showed me that document that I had scanned. Because what it had done is it had done a server-side character recognition, downloaded the search terms, so suddenly all the documents I had scanned became searchable on my desktop, you know, with the desktop search. And that was just amazing. And there's, so the more I use it, the more uses I find for it. I had a, uh, recently had a fender bender in, in uh, San Francisco where uh, you know, I, uh, another car bump, bumped into my car. Uh, you know, what do you do? Well, you take out your iPhone, you take a, you know, a photo of the other person's driver's license, put it in Evernote, you take a photo of the person's credit card information, put it in Evernote. Uh, you take a photo of the, the, your car, of the other car, then you call later the insurance, and their first question is, where exactly was this? And you're like, I forgot to actually write down the exact information. But that doesn't matter either, because you go to Evernote, it also has the location memorized of, of where I took that photo, so you just you know, look at Google Maps and you tell them, well, it was the corner of uh, you know, the, these two streets. And it's just, where am I going to store extraneous information that, that serves as a, as a resource I'm using for? It? Hmm. So, so um, Rob, as a, a, a someone also who's very interested in the uh, in, in investing opportunities in the intersection of sort of the real world and the online world, do you, did you get excited about what what's going on here? Yeah, I think um, the stuff that Gordon was showing is something that we've been thinking about for a while, and and, and a lot of it is about three areas we think of that are enabling technologies and the consumer applications that go on top of this. One is just the sensors. How do you capture all this information? The storage, where do you put it? And then the computation that it takes to retrieve this information. And you know, when we think about it, we kind of back up and we say, why do people care about this? I mean, we, we kind of go back to why, why does any of this matter? And I think um, there are some good examples there with Evernote, like why you would care. But I think if you were to ask the question of why would a consumer want to capture themselves digitally, um, let's put vanity aside for a minute and just think about memories, entertainment, and happiness in general. And then I think the other thing is, depending on the type of person you are, self-improvement. Because in order to improve, you need to have a baseline of kind of what you're doing in order to get better and to get advice around that. So. As we think about it, and we kind of break it out from the consumer side, we were an early investor in a company called iFi. And what iFi is all about is how do you easily store your memories from your camera? And they've developed a wireless memory card that goes into absolutely any digital camera that takes SD, turns it into a wireless device so that whenever you take pictures and then you turn the camera on or leave the camera on afterwards, the pictures are automatically sent to whatever destination you want to send them to, whether it's your PC at home or whether it's a website in the cloud. And when we think about other areas like why would you want to do this, think about self-improvement. Capturing memories can mean a lot of things. It could be uh, fitness, um, could be one of those things if you've ever heard of Fitbit or other devices that measure how much you work out and the energy that you use. Uh, that's how you could become better at, at sports or fitness. Or it could be self-improvement in terms of companies like Mint that actually measures and records every financial transaction that you make over the course of a year uh, makes it easier to take a look at how can I improve the way that I spend and invest money. So I, I think there are very powerful uh, consumer applications that come out of uh, capturing yourself digitally in all these different forms. So you know, one thing I think about a little bit here is that uh, there's almost two kinds of approaches there. One is to take data that's already that already exists in one form or another financial transaction data, uh, email uh, data, uh, other kinds of data that's out there on the web in some form or another, and put it together um, and, and make something new. And then sort of the second thing is to do um, a little of what Gordon's doing um, and generate uh, new data. Um, so I don't know, if, Ed, are you running your camera, Gordon? Uh, yeah, I, uh, 
Uh, this this camera has a kind of mi I'll call it a mixed blessing. This camera was invented uh, in the Microsoft Cambridge uh, uh, UK lab, and by little, uh, Lindsay Williams uh, in about 2003. And we immediately glomped onto it, saying, "Oh, this is going to be great. This is going to let us record all of that." And sure enough, uh, by glomping onto it, everybody gets attracted, focuses on that. And uh, in fact, in the book, we were as we were riding along, one of the, the editors said, "Wait a minute, you mean to say you're not wearing that all the time?" And I said, "Yeah, I don't wear it all the time. I I wear it occasionally when there's something, something, some event that you want to record. It's been useful. Uh, they're using it for for people with impaired memory to capture sort of episodes. So I think of it as episode, episodic kind of thing. I, that's what you saw was." One of the nicer uh, uh, scan uh, sequences of it. It takes a picture every 20 seconds or 20 to 30 seconds, and then you get this very rapid movement of through through some trajectory. Uh, I I've, I've always wanted audio on it, and in fact, normally I when I'm walking around, I've got I sometimes carry this guy too, which is an Olympus. Recorder. The the people in the in the UK above all said, "Oh, I said we need the audio." And then they say, "Oh no, that gets to that gets into privacy." Now here's a here's a country that has everything uh, being recorded, all their images. But um, frankly, I think uh, the, the, the you need audio in a lot of these things for annotation. But it's a it's been an interesting uh, device. Um, and I personally, I think the new iPhone uh, or iPod Nano that just came out with a with the recording capability, I think that's going to change a lot because that's going to put many more units out there than you've ever had before. Because it's a kind of a, an after, you know, you get it, uh, get it for free, and so you know, as opposed to a camera, you know, people are, are walking with cameras and cell phones, they take a lot of video, but. This is really pretty high quality stuff, and uh, uh, so I think there's going to be a lot more uh, more video recording. So I, I want to come back to that in, in a minute, but I, I want I want to give uh, Sunil a chance to get in, yeah. in, in part yes. because you're actually you've got a business, uh, you you co-founded a business that that's playing here, and maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, about recall and um, and what you're doing there. Um, uh, uh, sure, sure, sure. Uh, so look, let me uh, you know give a little bit of trajectory, you know. How I converted what was you know, a project uh, very similar to what Gordon was doing. I had recorded several years of my life while I was a PhD student at MIT, and we did an experiment to find out if you have an archive like this, could you solve day-to-day -day memory problems, remembering people's names, uh, things to do, uh, you know, or even you know, as Rob was talking about, you know, these you know, these things that perhaps at a more emotional level, can you actually? make yourself be smarter, have facts in, in your mind uh, as a result of this. So as part of this experiment, we built a Google-like search engine on this data, and we included audio as part of it as well, recorded conversations, etc. cetera. Um, the results were fascinating, and we took some of those lessons and, uh, and tried to make a product out of it. Well, actually, we did make a product out of it, and that is Recall. And Recall... Uh, is this spelled with a Q, by the way? Yes, it is spelled with a Q, R-E-Q-A-L-L. Um, Recall is a product that uh, we've had out for about uh, just over two and a half years now. Uh, anytime you forget something, uh, you uh, just say what you want to remember. And this is in, you know, in reference to some, uh, Gordon had mentioned this phenomenon, it's, it's kind of like the privilege of forgetting. Uh, you know, get it out of your mind, put it into some place safe quickly before you forget. And GTD, uh, GTD principles actually uh, talk a lot about this particular idea. Um, GTD. Getting things okay. done. So. <laughs> um, so get things out of your head quickly. And once it's in our system, we try to auto-organize it, put it into the right category, look for dates and times, figure out when and where you want to remember it. And, uh, 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 and then what we do is try to figure out how do we, uh, what is the right situation to remind you about? So the best example I can give is my current situation right now, which is uh, I'm under heavy memory pressure right now. There's going to be lots of questions. Public speaking is like that. There's a lot of memory pressure you have for remembering things to say. Well, what the product has done for me is it has produced a synthesis of the bios of all the other panelists here at the table for me. 
It did this by looking on my calendar, looking at the location, picking up the keywords, and synthesizing this for me. So on my way over here, I had a, you know, Guido, Eric, Gordon, and Rock. You know, I had their bios all ready to go. So that is, you know, what recall, uh, what we're trying to do: make it easy to capture, get it out of your head quickly, organize it for you, and then synthesize it for you. So at the time of need, that presentation is there. And immediately after this, this thing is going to disappear and present me with the things I probably need to do on my way home. And, uh, I'm sure my wife is going to do something. And, uh, does this live as a service on the web? I mean, where does the yeah? So structure? so uh, it it is a service on the web, and we have clients on a variety of things on the iPhone, BlackBerry, Web UI, etc. So people can interface it uh, with it with a, a variety of ways. Our iPhone and BlackBerry are particularly unique in that they have the ability to get your location which is one of the things we try to capitalize on. You know, if you want to remember something when you're there, uh, we need that location sensor to, uh, to capitalize, uh, capitalize on. I mean, Guido gave an example of where that location was incredibly valuable data to, for his situation. In our user base, you know, we have you know, people who target data, target things saying, I want to remember this when I'm at work, but I don't want to be bothered by it when I'm at home. So Part of our process is to filter the data out to the things you really need to remember at your particular location. We call it the here and now. We have a list of things that you need to know here and now that uh, is continuously adapting to your current situation by its ability to sense your location, read your calendar, etc., and then uh, search data. And one of the things we also do is search your Evernote data. That's, a, that's another example of you know, people storing their data into the system. Uh, you know, I keep my calendar on Google Calendar. Recall reads that, reads my Evernotes, puts it all together and figures out which of the Evernote's recall items that are relevant to the current thing on my calendar right now. So, so you know, one thing I think about here a little bit is, uh, um, and, I, and Robbie talked about this a little bit, is the, if you think about the process that we're, that's involved here, it's capture information, uh, store the information uh, somewhere, uh, do some sort of analysis to the information, and then, of course, have some ability to recall either specific bits of information or even better, uh, create new kind of meta information on top that you draw, draw to some conclusions like uh, maybe, you know, I'm, um, as you said, health, health, maybe health information, I'm, uh, why am I riding my bike slower up there time than before? Uh, you know, why maybe I should go to the hospital um, or something. Um, so um, I want to talk about each of those uh, at least a little bit separately. So let's talk about the, uh, the first part, the sort of the front end, the collecting the data. And, um, and, and Gordon, you were talking a little bit about the, the value of the, uh, the iPhone as a, uh, uh, or the iTouch really as a, 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 mm. you know, a, a video camera, an ability to collect uh, video information. But I wonder also whether there are opportunities, whether the opportunity is in generating new devices of some kind that are collecting information in a different way, or whether it's about taking devices that you already have, um, like the iPhone or uh, other smartphones, and, and doing some new clever things with them. Uh, well, my belief is that that uh, the I, that uh, mobile phones or cell phones are uh, are really doing, are are the replacement PCs because those are always with you. The we and the uh, the the amount of storage there will be a, a a terabyte in your whole life will be on your cell phone in ten years. So all of that stuff is uh, will be there, and that's just a good platform. So I see a platform developing around that. Uh, or is, it, is developing around that, which is the sense camera. In fact, uh, we just commented on this, that somebody is already doing that with a with an iPhone. Uh, uh, they can make this into uh, make an iPhone into this, and we have we've done that within research, uh, and then you get audio uh, also. So I think the I think the cell phone will be the plat platform. What's what's swirling around here is the whole problem of how much. How much crap can you tolerate? You know, like, uh, in your in your life, you know, I've got ah, eh, here's a, you know, I can't, you know, I got my good camera, I got my crappy camera, I got my uh, audio recorder. This this I love. This is a body media, uh, our body bug, and you wear this and it uh, measures your caloric output. And uh, I think this is, frankly, this is, uh, you know, I'm not wearing one. Uh, now uh, I have a, uh, but it, uh, it they purported to, to have EKG. I 
I have, have, have had enough heart problems. I won't, basically, I want an on-body EKG all the time. Um, and, and that can be done. So uh, these, these things really are very, very good in terms of, of health. Uh, so I think health is one of the, is one of the big, uh, so to speak, killer apps, as I. Um, and I had, in fact, I had a recent, I had to go to a hospital uh, emergency room, and I had, and they didn't know me in there. I mean, if I, if I go to Stanford, why they, you know, they, I've almost got a room there, so they know me. <laughs> uh, but, but going, but I went to a San Francisco hospital, and, and they didn't have any, anything. And so I was, it had, a, with the USB, there's too much information. So uh, there's about six items that you carry into an emergency room that everybody should do. That's stuff that should come out of Health Vault or Google Health or whatever. Uh, or, uh, or, or that should, anyone who's running Evernote, they ought to take those six documents uh, and make sure they're there. Uh, so that when, if you ever go into one of those, then those things can be printed out, and uh, you know they know they know what it is. So, you know the, the standard first sets of sheets of you know, immunization and uh, allergies and stuff like that, and and also who can who who can give who who has command over your life if if you know if your spouse is not there. There, that's a yeah, that turns out to be a key thing, you know. Uh, so things like that are where a great cloud service for health uh, really all is, I think, is essential. So, so I mean, you know, it, which I'm talking about uh, not spying my inner geek, this would be my outer geek, right, if you're carrying around six devices on your body of various kinds. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> but, so, I guess we wonder, right, so that, like, well, maybe the, the opportunity is to take the existing device that you're already walking around with, um, which may be an iPhone or some other smartphone, and do some clever things with it. I mean, do you think that's the... Do you think that's the way it ends up? Do this, this unfolds? Yeah, I, I think in many cases, yes. I mean, the, the I think smart, smartphones today are getting, are getting incredibly powerful. Right? I mean, we can record sound, video, uh, GPS location, acceleration, magnetic <coughs> direction. You know, and uh, I think before you know we had temperature and uh, you know uh, our metric pressure. pressure. You know, it's, it's, it's just a question of time. Um, it's 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 really amazing for me how many different devices the iPhone has replaced at this point. Mm. Right? The, uh, you know, it, uh, uh, if I if I travel, uh, you know, I'm no longer carrying a you know an alarm clock. I'm no longer carrying a GPS for running to know where I'm going. I'm no longer carrying maps. You know, I'm no longer carrying travel notes or printouts of my um, um, uh, of my flights. So so I think that's a huge step. Right? And I think on the other hand, there's still some areas where where we need additional sensors where we don't have them yet. Right? And I think I think the iFi is a great example where you know if you take that put a digital camera. Uh, I'm, I, I remember one case where there was a company that basically had a, a cheap digital camera with an iFi. In their, in their meeting room, and every time they had a discussion uh, with a whiteboard, um, um, you know, they afterwards took a photo of the whiteboard and automatic copy it in Evernote. So, so basically, they had a record of, of everything ever done on the whiteboard, which now was, you know, searchable. These things. So, I, I think it, I think we'll see we'll see combination of both. So, so yeah, I mean, your your approach has been to use um, <coughs> existing devices, right? We call to use. We call you need a uh, you need a BlackBerry or a, or a, or an iPad, basically, as your uh, your uh, data entry device, right? Uh, actually, no. You can you, you know you can use a normal telephone. You have a telephone number. You can use Instant Messenger. You can use the web. All of these things. And so, but you know, the principle behind what you're talking about is essentially true. Is that you know capturing of uh, this data is you know we do a portion of it, but we realize that. You know, we don't want to be the, you know, a duplicate entry point for a lot of people where they put their data. You already put your data in a variety of places. And what we want to do is to be able to tap into that data and make it useful to you at the time you need to recall. And that's, you know, it's no coincidence we named the company Recall because uh, that to us is one of the more fascinating, challenging, and also what we believe is the monetizable problem about all this. Uh, you know, capturing devices, et cetera. You know, we're, we're now at a time where we're seeing an explosion in capture. Uh, because the devices have significantly eased this thing, uh, I remember you know back in you know Gordon went and uh, and I know I did went through you know Herculean efforts to you know create capturing uh, early on because the devices didn't really you know give us the opportunity to do it easily you know I had a huge device wrapped around my neck recording all my audio conversations it was kind of crazy uh, MIT it's, it's quite normal um, but that's a different story um, so. Uh, but now that you know we do have things like you know, the iPhones, BlackBerry, ubiquitous capture uh, uh, device, etc., that you know this data proliferation is going to be significantly easier. I mean, the 
there's you know some interesting social and legal questions around all that as well. And uh, so, but, uh, do, but do, you, do you think it makes it easier to resolve fights with your spouse? Um, <laughs> only if it's written down. I, uh, I, I'm, I, I'm going to cite the case of, uh, of Deb Roy, who's a professor at MIT, and in his house, he has recording instruments on every single room. And I, I'm not kidding. Uh, and it's every single room, there's a camera. A Is he still married? Uh, <laughs> this was part of the deal when they got married. So, <laughs> She, yeah, it, 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 you know, I, I talked to him. I've talked to his wife about this too. It's it's it's, it's quite funny. And uh, but what he also described to me is you know the exact situation. You know, the there's a conflict protocol they have, which is one of them walks into the room, and in each room there's a, a way to turn the system on and off. And once one of them turns it off, the other one knows that something bad's about to happen. <laughs> So, so, um, so here we are generating all this data, including you know, data sometimes maybe you don't want anyone else to see. Um, where is it all going to live? Does it live in the cloud? Does it live in a server uh, in my house? Does it live, um, am I paying for storage? Am I, does it need to be centralized? How does, where does the, what's the data model look like, Rob? I, I actually think what's going to happen is, I mean, I think everybody on this panel may have an opinion, but the answer is going to be you're actually not going to know where your data is because so much is getting backed up in different places and here and there, et cetera, that I think people are, whether they like it or not, are slowly losing control of their data in terms of where it is. So they may know that they have a copy. There may be a kind of a golden copy you know you have, but whether you like it or not, you're going to find that computation and, and the PCs and all these devices are automatically backing themselves up that it's inevitable that your data is going to be out in the cloud, right? No, and, and connected and, to a network. Right. It's going to be in the cloud. And, and if you think about it, uh, you know, where is your, uh, where are your Gmail messages being stored? I don't know. Uh, you know, where, where are your <coughs> pictures on Flickr being stored? And no one knows that. But when you start thinking about pulling stuff, uh, pulling uh, all of this information together, Maybe does it not have to be in the same place? So you're talking about the um, you're not talking about one single place to, that has everything, as opposed to maybe one single point where you can go kind of get to. Good. Yeah, we went through. We started out, uh, and uh, for those of you who know Van of our Van of our Bush's paper uh, on a Memex, uh, and that was kind of a model, and that had. A, can, uh, can I just say, by the way, that that just that paper, which was written in 1945, yeah. Um, is on the web. It was yes. published in the Atlantic. Um, the, one, the version of the Atlantic was not even the original uh, paper, but it's on the Atlantic Monthly website. You can find it online pretty easily. Um, and it's it's an amazing description. Uh, we can talk about some more of it of exactly the phenomenon you're talking about. This was written, you know, um, what's that, 65 years ago. But uh, anyway, so that was kind of a, a model. So that the idea that it was in this desk. And that held over for a number of years with us. Of, well, it's at my PC, and the PC's on the desk, so it's so that's Memex. Uh, but you know, increasingly, uh, the problem. Uh, and then I was very happy when we had Home Server come out because the first thing you see is, well, you got a family there, and then everybody's got their computers, and you need to back them all up. And so Microsoft had built a Home Server that I thought was, you know, is very useful for for that. And now with more and more stuff on the web. The question is sort of, is, where does it migrate? Uh, in fact, that spun, we're, we're talking, we have a bunch of canonical uh, problems that we talk about in recording everything. And that one, basically, that's roughly like, that's where the hell is my data problem? You know, uh, did I, I stored it somewhere, but, you know, is it on this or that? Or where's a photo? Or, or you know, did, did I move this? It, the idea of it's all auto magic, uh, you know, I like to believe it, it's all there and that, that everything is, there's a simple unified store and, you know, Microsoft goes off and tries to think about building that every now and then, but it's very difficult and it's increasingly more difficult, you know, as, it, as it's in your health, it's in a, you know, in Epic in a, at one of the, you know, local Stanford or the, uh, or one of the hospitals, it's and all of these systems, and, and, and or it's in your bank stuff, and all those systems 
All those guys treat their data about that issue, those transactions, whether it's he and health and bank, health and banking are the same, are are like. They said the data is ours. You go there and you log into that, and if you want to talk with us, you go there and speak our our language. If you want an email, they don't have things called email. I mean, you basically go there and and talk and send an email inside the system, and then an email will will ultimately emerge. But but you know, I hate these systems because they it's they uh, they get in the way of the communication channel. But nevertheless, your data is all there. Right. So, so, no, go ahead. so, so, I think I have a very strong, strong opinion on that question. Okay. Um, and I think the only place where the data will, will live, and even the midterm, will be the cloud. And, and you'll, you'll have, essentially, you may, st you always store data locally, and you have obviously data on my mobile phone, on, on my desktop. But I think essentially these won't be much more than cash copies of, of the data um, that, that's in the cloud. And I think, and it's not even that I, that I feel I'm losing control over it. Actually, I want it to sit there because oh. you know it's, it's a little bit like. A bank is much better in, in taking care of my money. You know, hiding it under the mattress. You know, after well considering it is, is probably not the safest way to, to store you know my, my fortune or, or you know, what I have today. So and I think the same is true for data. I think over time we'll just see that that companies that that really specialize in that are just much better in storing your data than, than you will ever be. I think that the the, the second and possibly even more important argument is that data in itself doesn't create a whole lot of value for me. Um, I, I need services that that use this data to do things with this data. For example, the, the document that I upload, I want the service to, to OCR this, this document and send me back the, the metadata that allows me to easily search it. You know, if I upload photos, I'd like to have a service that looks for faces and you know, categorizes them, and, you know, maps faces to names so I, I can find easily um, and people in these photos. And, and these things are only possible uh, if, there's, if, the, if the data is stored in a way that's easily accessible, you know, where, where other people can write applications and services that right. access them. I think the only place where this can live is the cloud. So, so where's the oh, yeah, I, I was just saying that the another interesting analog that at least we face with this is the kind of trust relationship people need to have with the holders of this data. Like we are holders of people's data now. Some of these things are somebody you know could be something somebody something saying like oh I have to paint the spare room. But if we're talking about things like medical data, financial data, etc., we have certain expectations about the trust relationship we have with the entities that hold that data. What does that mean when it's your memory data, what if it were your diary, that, le that level of information, will we need to have a new set of protocols or a new set of trust relationships with the holders of your memory data or your second brain? Well, so. and we've seen hints of this where we've had, um, uh, so uh, Yahoo is shutting down GeoCities, right? So um, if you had a, a, a website, um, um, and you, know, you, you sort of think of the website maybe as being sort of, sort of permanent or maybe semi-permanent, which is only true until the place where it's hosted is um, is taken offline, and now you you have to quickly figure out: Can I get my data back? Can I put it somewhere else? Um, so there there is actually so again this this brings up this idea that there are sort of two sets of data. There's the data that's about you, but generated by someone else, right? So your banking data, your healthcare data, um, and that data is protected in at least partially protected by various kinds of legal requirements about how, how they can use that data, um, how they, uh, how, what happens to the data in the event that something happens to what the company that holds the data. But there are the same rules that apply if you're talking about personal data that you've uploaded. So um, if, you know, if Flickr were to go out of business tomorrow, um, if, uh, you know, or one of the other online photo sharing sites, if that's where your, your photos live, um, you're out of luck. I suppose. So uh, there are some interesting questions, not just about, uh, but both about from a regulatory standpoint, what requirements should people have uh, to, in order to have that trusted relationship with people? Um, uh, and then also how much should you, should you feel comfortable putting that data out there? Uh, you know, in a, in a, uh, maybe, it's just, maybe it's not, you know, in many cases these are startup companies, smaller companies that may not have a long track record. Um, how where is, where should people be about that? Uh, well, one of the banks, uh, I think Wells, uh, Wells Fargo, is actually I think, uh, in, uh, taking on some of that. They had a service that I don't know if it's been uh, started yet, but it was, there was an announcement of one. They were going to store data. Um, and because I said, well, there's a good place, you know, 
banks have, you, you know, have that. You, you do have those, those trust. I don't know why we have that so much trust. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's because we learned some things. We hate those guys so much, so they've got to be really good. Um, and, uh, so we trust them. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, though, and and you know, I we wrote about ten in the book. We write about ten startups, and one one of course is a Swiss data bank that uh, that holds that. There have been some. Uh, and only that we wrote that before, before the Swiss decided to turn over uh, 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 banking data. But uh, uh, and there's been a couple of cases of, uh, or a case of person not having to reveal their password on a on a file uh, because that was regarded as in, you know invasion of privacy, um, and um, so. I think e-memory may actually take, take on the role of being an ex being reviewed as an extension of uh, of our real memory. So I, I, I'm going to discoverable. I want to look at this a little bit because um, when you're talking about uh, managing data that is of your own creation, so your photos, for example, yeah. uh, that's one thing. Uh, when you're talking about recording data, um, you just so Snail, you might want to talk about this because you went through this process. Uh, you're recording all of the conversations that you have any given day, um, or taking video of all the things you're doing in any given uh, given day. Um, presumably, unless you're you know, if you're a hermit, I suppose it's not much of an issue. But assuming you're a regular person who has conversations with actual people, um, do you need permission from these people? Are there legal implications to um, you know? Are, are you liable to? Uh, do you have to follow like the wiretapping laws? Uh, do you have to wear a big sign that says? Warning! I'm recording everything you say. Um, how, how did you approach that when you were doing dealing with this stuff? Um, you know, so there, there's actually I, I was under some heavy constraints because it was an actual experiment done, and I had to follow the all the regulatory guidelines of doing a, an experiment on human subjects. Uh, my application was huge in order to get this thing uh, to, to get this thing approved. But uh, so I'll, I'll speak briefly about the experimental thing. But I think there's a larger question here about what happens when we put this out into real society. In the experimental thing, basically, I had to have all subjects sign off, and then each conversation I had to get uh, verbal consent uh, for each one of those things. There was a there was a significant social awkwardness that uh, ensued for you know permission each time, uh, and uh, and uh, and I did talk about that when uh, in some of the, the the papers. But let me get to this other point, which is you know when we put this thing into the real world, now you have to follow the legal constraints within the different environments. So. In fact, you know, when I did this at MIT, that was one of the worst places to do it because Massachusetts laws were particularly strict about doing audio recording, in particular in public places. Uh, and other places in the country are much looser. Uh, and also, if you were, if I were to do this in Europe, there would be a different set of rules. Now, now we have this, you know, morass of different laws that you know, none of us are going to be able to keep track of. I mean, there's. There's a certain element of, uh, of inevitability that Gordon talks about, about uh, this ubiquitous capture, total recall, et cetera. And when that happens, you know, we don't want each one of us to be policemen of the, the individual laws for each different state and to be able to keep track of that. And you know, because of the inevitability of this thing, uh, I suspect that we as a society are going to need to look at this and say, what are the legal protocols we want to have you know, if we want to have a better memory? Uh, and then there's another thing, you know, which is the social awkwardness of, you know, I don't know how many of you felt awkward when Gordon was taking pictures of all of you. Uh, I certainly don't, um, but there are They're not very good, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I won't publish them with it. I would be curious to find out, you know, how many, uh, how many people were, uh, did, feel, uh, did feel awkward about that. But, so the, 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 uh, I think there's a spectrum of things, both legal and social, that, that come into play here. And, uh, and you know, this is a... You know, I wish I had the crisp answer, but in fact, the, the people I've spoken to about this, there's a spectrum. Uh, I get people on very much on both sides of the fence on this one, and they both have very justifiable points. I, I wonder also about the uh, the reaction for people who are concerned about privacy. You know, there's so much concern about the uh, privacy of data, various kinds on the web. Um, I'm trying to remember 
Scott McNeely talking about, you know, forget over on Thursday yeah. and Friday. So, um, uh, Rob, do you, do you worry about that as you think about, like, business opportunities here? Is there... I, I think this idea of, of privacy to a certain extent, we were talking about this a little earlier, is um, something that old people worry about more than young people. <laughs> Seriously. And, and you think about it, it, it's funny. We all remember when we were growing up about how our parents and the prior generation, you know, they didn't get it with TVs or phones, etc. We see the same thing happening right now with privacy, this idea that, you know, telling our kids and telling the next generation, be careful about what you put on Facebook, because it'll come back to haunt you in 20 years. But I think that a lot of that is just because of the intergenerational kind of discomfort with technology that I think younger people today, I, I think when you have people that are in their, in their teens and 20s now, when they're 40 and 50 and they're in positions of power in the hiring, they're going to see the photos, and they're really not going to care because they're going to say, well, that's just part of what happened. I think privacy and the way that people think about privacy today is a little bit of a, I think, generational uh, hangover uh, than it is kind of the reality going forward. And if you go back through time, you, you go back before people were mobile and moved around and could have anonymity. When you grew up in that village and you didn't move from that village, and... Um, you know, your wife had a kid that was clearly not yours. It was pretty obvious that something had happened. There was a lack of privacy. And I think this illusion of privacy that we have is something that was really only about a 100 to 200 year window kind of in the history of, of, of mankind. So, you know, that, that's kind of, I, I think what's going to happen is the cultural norms are going to shift around that a lot. And people are going to become more accepting. Yeah, I mean, it seems like there's a big shift that has happened. If you think about, say, the reaction that some people have, even to something like targeted advertising, right, where you're not, you're not even dealing with, um, you know, people think targeted advertising and they, they think the arrow is pointed directly at them, right? But it's, it's more about behavioral, and so, you know, if you're, um, you know, so if you're a, uh, you've been, you've been uh, surfing around a lot of automobile sites on the web, uh, so suddenly when you, you, know, you go to ESPN.com, um, you're still getting automobile ads. Uh, uh, so, no matter, so, so there's some, some uh, which, I mean, frankly, as, uh, as someone works in the media, I want to see people thinking about new, uh, clever, and more profitable ways to generate uh, uh, advertising revenue on the web. But there are people who look at this as, well, you know too much information about me. You've pulled together more information about me than I want you to have. And that's without any of what we're talking about, that's just based on some, you know, how you surf around on the web. So I just wonder whether we have a long way to go um, uh, from there to a world in which lots of your activity is being recorded, re being recorded by other people. And it, and it raises another question, which is whether all of this information is going to be discoverable legally. Uh, are people going to, you know, subpoena Gordon's uh, um, you know, uh, Gordon's pictures because uh, maybe he was walking by some uh, location and something was happening that should have been happening. They're going to try. <laughs> well, actually, I think the more practical part there has to do with the way uh, corporations treat uh, their own own information. We've gone gone through some of that uh, at Microsoft. I, uh, and this kind of standard thing, and I worked, I consulted with it for Intel for a while, and they were very much, very much uh, every uh, year, six months or something, you go into everybody's office and you basically trash the whole, whole thing. Their memory's gone, you know. Uh, so you, you know, uh, perhaps that's why they, uh, the, the, the uh, Itanium group, Forgot about the 432. And everything. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it didn't. It didn't have a corporate memory or something like that. But, but you know, I'm. I'm. I go down on the other side. Sure, you're going to say uh, some competitive things like we got to cut off their air supply and tell them. And that's. But that's plain old business. I mean, that's the way, you know, business is. And uh, uh, it just sounds a little crude, out of, uh, out of context. But. Uh, uh, I think you win more than you lose by keeping having a, a long corporate memory. Certainly, it's true in research that right. you know uh, the idea may not come at, come due for another 15 years. It you know it was somebody talked about it, and now for some reason that idea or something enables that new uh, that idea to be a fruit. And so I 
I I get a lot of you know there's uh, I, I I go back and look at a lot of stuff uh, that's 20 years old or something like that and wonder why why didn't we learn you know so why are we doing this again I mean exactly the same we're doing exactly the same thing I mean. So I'm going to uh, get to some audience questions in a minute, but I want to do one last thing which, uh, before we do that, which is, uh, I wonder if each of you could talk for a minute or two about either the uh, uh, one company that really stands to benefit from this, or, or a company that maybe doesn't, uh, doesn't exist yet, but that you'd like to you know, start, or uh, where the biggest opportunities are here to kind of create a, uh, um, a, a big um, business opportunity? Um, let's get our VCs to sort of start off. Do you have any thoughts about that? Um, sure. I, well, so I, I think I talked about Evernote already. Uh, you know, I, I really, I really like what they are doing. There's also, um, so I think <coughs> one of the companies that probably, in terms of, uh, is, is pretty close um, to, to the model that um, Edward is describing in his book, and, and it has it's probably one of the, the larger user bases with over a million users that they gathered in their in their first year. I mean, I think. To, to answer that question in a slightly more general way, I think the, the thing that, that is missing for me at the moment is with many of, of the, the companies that are sort of in the space that are used to store information online, is, is the, the, the lack of uh, uh, ways to access my information. Like I, I, um, you, you mentioned, I did this little exercise by asking, well, how many different online sites do I have information about my life on? And uh, it turned out to be uh, 83. Um, and uh, out of those 83, um, uh, five of them I could search via the desktop search on my laptop, mm. the other 78 I can't. So this is basically very compartmentalized information that's that's you know, very hard to access in any are, sense. Are these sites that have information about you, but you don't have access to the information that they have? That's so, what no, no the, the, I mean, I have access to the information. I can log in and I can view something specifically, but but I can't search it. Right? I, well, I may be able to search it through a science-specific piece of functionality, um, but not in a centralized way. If I want to know, you know, tell me everything about um, the Churchill Club, uh, you know, in, in my, my bank records, my health records, who knows, you know, in my, uh, my calendar, my email, and so on. For email or calendar, this works, right? My, my bank records are essentially not searchable. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, you know, and, and uh, you know, yeah. my, so my social network is, is fairly searchable, but it's not searchable through a centralized interface, right? I can't say I want to search my bank records, my social... So, so there's, apparently you have these silos, you know, which, which takes, a lot, takes away a lot of the value of this information right. for me. Mm -hmm. So if, you know, if I... Um, I think, you know, the, the things that I think are, are really move this forward are, are companies that are that are very open, that, that are good at integrating, you know, like like iFi and Evernote and, uh, and and recall, you know, that, that sort of all plug into each other and, and create these sort of dense dense networks of information that then really allow you to, to reap the benefits. Rob, do you have thoughts about this? Yeah, we you know we've talked about a few specific companies, um, whether it's um, uh, Evernote or iFi, I think there's another company people may or may not have heard of called Rescue Time, where you actually put it, you install it on your PC or your device, and it actually tracks how you waste time on your PC, all the different ways. <laughs> I should use that as well, it's, it's very scary. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, then there's the helmet cams, which my 13-year-old son just hates. He's an incredible skier, but he hates putting on the helmet cam for some reason, it just drives him nuts. But I think... Because um, then you look like a guy who's kind of walking around with a camera on your head. Yeah, also no. This is hard. That's the best thing you can do. But you know what, it's okay. He'll thank me in 20 years. Um, not for making him look like a dork. <laughs> um, but anyways, the, the thing I think actually um, of capture that's really going to matter, if, if you were just to talk about a trend that we haven't talked about it, about as much is very specifically location and capturing location information. Uh, if you just think about one of the senses is where things are and kind of how that factors into mobile. I, I think as just a separate thing where I think a great area for investment is going forward is I think there's going to be a great, amazing new ad unit created around the intersection of intent and location. It, it doesn't exist yet. I think it's a big part of the reason that Google is so aggressive with Android and um, is GPS and all these other location sensing things are made available through APIs to smart developers and entrepreneurs. There are going to be all sorts of things that come out of this, and I think we'll look back in 10 years at uh, GPS going into all these devices and other location overlays is something that unlocked kind of the true potential of mobile devices and the mobile ecosystem together with the APIs. It's sort of the, you're walking by at Starbucks and uh, you're showing it's coffee drinking time and then up pops an ad saying, 
How about a nice latte? There are, there are those sorts of things, or it's, uh, you know, somebody put in a reminder that says, do you want to kill yourself at Starbucks? See if every time you walk by it is. But, but I think it's in, in you know, and, and it, it, it's in and around location um, and how you tie it to all these other things, all these existing web services that I think the, um, the next big Google-like opportunity is going to come out of. I don't know what it is. We're, Obviously, we're trying to figure out what it is, but I think location is the, the big thing that people are going to want to record and track. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to jump in on that. I mean, you know, it's uh, you know, in our market analysis, we've uh, we've estimated that there are hundreds of billions of digital e-memory utterances that happen every year. Most of these, you know, large percent of these are lost. Uh, things you you know would ordinarily write down on a scrap of paper. You know you might SMS somebody a reminder, etc. All of these things are lost. And when we look at the recall data set, which is akin to this uh, to these kind of utterances, we are finding a large percentage of these things have some type of monetizable intent behind it. You know it could be something as simple as you know or something as direct as somebody saying I want to buy something, mm -hmm. or it could be something a little bit more indirect, which is it's somebody's birthday. So. These are the kind of things that we are looking at and we are observing as part of our data set, which indicates, and you know, to follow on the trend that Rob was talking about here, is that you know, there is an opportunity here, and we believe a very you know, lucrative opportunity to take these utterances and one capture them, that's one of the things that we were talking about them, and then connecting them to situations where you can actually make that purchasing intent. And even with the location sensor, you know, like, you know, here, recall knew I was here, so, you know, reminded me of this particular thing. Well, you know, there was a birthday utterance that somebody sends me as a, you know, text message or an email, have it captured the recall. And then, you know, when I'm at the store, this would be the time to execute on that purchasing arrangement, or you could do advertising or, you know, these various other angles. But, you know, in our observation of the, you know, of the, you know, the amount of communications people do and what they are putting into recall, we, you know, we see that there is a, a quite a big fish here. So uh, one one last uh, question for Gordon, and then we'll open to questions. So you've been at you've been doing this at Microsoft for ten years. Mm -hmm. Does Microsoft see a big opportunity here besides like you know selling more PCs? Like? <laughs> you, you uh, show this, by the way. The yeah, PCs are yeah, going to die. Right. But, Actually, I, I I get I have reviews, you know, project reviews all the time of people want to uh, build uh, you know little pieces of stuff here here and there. Uh, we we felt that it should be on a, based on a database, and so our stuff is based on a database. I don't think it needs to be, but and one way of looking at this is that what we're doing is simply following the trajectory of a natural evolution of computing. I happen to think that's that's personal computing uh, or computing. That's one of what we're doing is by this capture is one of the. One of its roles in in its life, and I, I've 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 worked on computers uh, for uh, a number of many years. Uh, both <laughs> programmed a, a machine that Turing had helped design, and uh, the you know, and I I just believe that uh, this is the role, a, a natural role, an evolutionary role. So from a platform standpoint. I think what's going to happen is a lot of the, as these things become available, you know, Apple, you know, Linux, uh, Microsoft, uh, Google will will agglomerate these things into the platform to try to make make things more and more useful. But uh, but if I look at the trajectory. I, the way it be, maybe it's because of the eyes I have of looking at it as as the digital feng shui. It's the thing that <laughs> that it, it's. That's his, I think that's his natural role in life to uh, be, uh, be a memory. Um, and, uh, you know, we, in the book we talked about, you know, work, health, learning, and, and life and afterlife. And along that line, one of the startups that I've been involved with in, in Sydney is a, is a call, thing called My Cyber Twin. And so I, uh, if you want to go and converse with me about this subject, why? You can, I'm, I'm just Gordon Bell. You go to my cyber twin, and and you can start, and we can talk about this in, in uh, some detail about uh, uh, 
about what e-memory is all about. Well, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to in a bot, in a kind of in a bot, an interactive bot stand. I'm going to resist the urge to ask you about computing in the afterlife. And, yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm going to open up to questions. We have a microphone uh, that's back there. Very interesting topic, and uh, not being an expert here, I'll throw this out anyway. Uh, it seems to me, correct me if I'm wrong, video search and processing video is really tough right now. And if you think of recording a person's life on video, I mean, these security cameras that have video, it's very hard to even access it. So, of course, one could say Moore's Law will take care of this, but is there some other thoughts? No. No, okay. Interested in your thoughts on it. Well, my reaction is don't. No. Uh, you know, but but video is pretty good. video for a consumer. There's very good video libraries. If you look at CNN, you look at any of the broadcasting thing. Those those guys have got hot systems there. They know what's said. That whole thing's they've been they pay through the nose to get it done. And you can nail a politician. You know, talk about my life bits. It's my political life bits going back. I don't know how far back they go on all these characters, but they dredge up. Uh, you know, almost instantaneously, uh, I'm always amazed at why. Well, now, 25 years ago, you were on this very program, and you said, uh, you know, and I was like, wow, that, what a, I, I'm impressed with the system. But, but that seems like that probably happens because someone's adding metadata to the, you, you, uh, you, if they transcribe, if they transcribe, but for, per, you know, I, I make very little use of data, video, Video to me is has to do with capturing life and afterlife and making stories and you know like this 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 the video that we, uh, the picture the sound picture that we made here uh, and I don't to get it to a point where it's got a lot of use day by day I'm not sure what that will be uh, it could be meetings we've got there's a great program. Um, uh, uh, that does meeting capture, and that's, that's nice to have a video with that, being able to fast forward and be able to get speech to do speech to text, but you got to do generalized speech to text to get there. Okay. So, yeah, so in, in our experiment, we, we did audio, we didn't do okay. video, and even with audio, just the comprehensive audio record of you know this large period of time was just too much. I mean, yeah. and there's just so much bath water with the babies. I mean, just you know, hearing people talk about a tostada that they ate six years ago was pretty uninteresting. <laughs> I mean, it's and you know, a, apart from that, it actually created uh, it, the experiment uh, it, uh, elucidated a problem: is that when you put all of this extra data in there then it interferes with a high quality retrieval. And that was uh, creating a significant impediment for users who were trying to actually target it and find something that they had forgotten. Um, so this is one of the reasons why we've adopted a strategy with Recall not to capture everything and make it more self-selected. Um, now, there may be a time in the future when retrieval technology can catch up, but you know, the, the analogy would be from going back to Google days to Alta Vista days. Uh, that and it's actually even worse than that. But you know, we'll we'll, get, we'll make that the analogy. It, it is a step backward on what we can do, and that high quality retrieval, the high quality recall, was really something in our experiments and you know, currently in our observation with the product was far more important than that universal capture. So there was. Uh, yes. Uh, it's been noted by the panel that web services exist in silos, and a lot of those silos have very specific uh, languages that they speak. And there are bank vaults and medical record vaults, and and every time you renew your driver's license, or you buy stocks, or you buy groceries, or you know that's data in different places. I'm wondering what the panelists think of the idea of is it possible that a data concierge will emerge, which represents someone where there's a web service that essentially aggregates and speaks to all of those services that has the language of all of those services down. And is essentially like your online avatar conducting transactions on your behalf, knows where you are, and knows what you want to do, and executes things for you. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is like the Mint's argument that you know they have, you know, they they put all that together, and you know we face that challenge of wanting to interface with all the different things to make them to aggregate them, bring them together, and make them part of this you know comprehensive summary. So uh, yeah. You know, we'd love it if somebody were to do something like that.
Rob, well, do you want to, I mean, you, you guys were investors in MIDS. Do you, do you want to talk a little bit about how? Yeah, we were actually early pre-launch uh, investors in Mint. We were actually the largest shareholders in the company. And it, it's interesting because the, the trend that you're talking about, um, you, you say silos of web services. Actually, the silos are going away, or at a minimum, people are opening up shoots on all the silos. Um, to allow data in and out of them. And it's through the form of APIs, increased API standardization. And for everybody that's heard of mashups, they know that it's becoming increasingly um, stuff that can be traded back and forth. In fact, there's companies like Blue Kai and others that are actually trading on behavioral information just for advertising targeting. And what they do is they take information from all the cookies and websites that you visited and then they take that and they basically sell that to different people to be able to target advertising. So that information, a lot of what you're talking about, web services, that it's coming together in kind of specialized concierges. So with Mint, for example, what, what Mint um, is doing is basically saying, come to our website. I know this sounds crazy, but it says, give us your login credentials for all your bank accounts, your credit cards. Uh, your brokerage statements, we'll uh, your credit reports, trust us, and uh, you know we'll pull it all together. Now, the reality is all you're, all you're doing is you're giving them information to access the data, not to place trades on your behalf, and they've made a very strict kind of decision to do that. But this is happening, and it's only accelerating. Yes, in the back. Hi, uh, David McCullough with Cisco. Um, a lot of the things you've talked about seem to be uh, have applications for self-improvement or self-help or the individual's gain. But it seems like collecting all this memory and data would be really even more useful for teams. So, uh, you know, Guido, here's something that Gordon's working on. You didn't know that, but this might help you with your project. Have you seen any tools or applications that are specifically focused on gathering all this data for benefit team? We have a product like that, which is basically taking the mileage taking the, uh, the index for uh, a team and putting that in a centralized way so that uh, people, anyone can access that. Uh, the, the documents themselves are, or transactions are under control of the in, individual, but at least there's knowledge about the fact that there, there is a, a, a document in somebody's hard drive that is there. You're in there. Uh, in my chair, I think that's that's definitely happening. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm, for example, when I do my expenses, I typically just scan my receipts and then share that note, Evernote notebook with my assistant, and she can just pull it out there. So I think you know this, these these many of these online sort of data stores and sharing applications, if you put even a minimal set of um, sort of delegation functionality on top of it, they become incredibly powerful team team uh, tools to or teams to work together. Yeah, I think there's another element of this too, which is that. Uh, uh, so if you think about, say, an application that's, say, health-related, uh, where, you know, we've been talking about an individual basis where uh, uh, you, maybe some patterns emerge in the way your behavior uh, has changed or something over time. But what to me is more interesting is to take that data and compare it to the X number of other people who mm -hmm. are engaged in comparable activities and their, what happens when their behavior changes in a certain way and how did, so it, it seems like there's a, now that's, that, there's an extra layer of complication there, which is you know, added privacy questions and who aggregates the data and all those kinds of things. But it, it seems like you could you, you'd be able to use that as an interesting discovery tool for changes in the way um, you know people behave and how that that may have that, you know, implications well, for health and other ways. The, the VHA is the one one thing that we all kind of cite as the the that, and I'd say Kaiser as the two systems that. I, are uh, that you'd like your you'd, you'd like your bits there if something goes wrong with you, uh, because they have all of, uh, data across uh, you know an eight eight to fifteen million people, and so you can do cross uh, uh, cross uh, 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 for disease kinds of epid epidemiological studies. I proposed in Australia that we put all of the the, uh, I think they're annual or biannual mammograms in the cloud. Uh, and it would only cost 100, 150K to store a million mammograms a year. Um, and uh, the, uh, you know, they're a little bit sheepish about that because they're a little more uptight about data than we are in terms of health data. But if we can ever get there, why, 
the numbers are staggering. You wipe out a whole whole sheaths of organizational crap in <laughs> hospitals, and and you end up with uh, uh, with something that you can you you got uh, cross. You know you know about even only asking their weight, their name, their where they live, where they grew up, their age. Uh, you know, any maybe a couple of other things, you get enormous amount of benefit in terms of, of studies about that. Uh, there's some social networks that are coming up like this. Uh, uh, patients like me is a social network where people are uh, have a particular kind of disease, and they're all signing. They're signing into that, and uh, the amount you because the problem is on weird diseases. You know, you only see, uh, you only have four, four in this area, and you know, and so you want to want to get all those people uh, uh, together uh, so that you can you can get. I've had some had an experience in that in that area, and it, it is that you really need to get above the individual hospital and um, uh, level to be able to do interesting stuff. Uh, on the subject of privacy and protecting oneself uh, potentially against the dark side, uh, how does one opt out of a system and say, I don't want my data collected or analyzed by anybody unless you get my written permission? Um, in the art world, I may remember the film Brazil with Terry Gilliam. There was a printer going out with all the government's data from information retrieval, and Tuttle was now Tuttle, and they went and arrested the wrong guy. Or in the film... Uh, the lives of others, they were collecting all the information for the wrong reason, not because the guy was a traitor, but because the communist boss wanted the guy's girlfriend. So there's plenty of people who can gather this data, and, you know, I, I mean, I think in the last couple of years, was it AT&T who was gathering the data illegally for, for the government? Right. I mean, how does one protect oneself against these type of issues and opt out of the system? Is it possible to say, the data you've collected, get rid of it, delete it all, and get my permission before you go? Well, get rid of your credit cards for starters. Uh, because, I mean, take health records. Uh, all you have to do is mine what people are buying in all of the drugstores, uh, and you've got a pretty good clue as to what disease they have and how bad it is. Uh, never mind that going into, the, into a health record or anything like that. All the, all these systems that, that monitor transactions where transactions are where you can buy buy a transaction. I mean, you can buy buy these complicated transactions. You you can mine the hell out of that and find out more about it, the individual than than they ever knew about. And, you know, there was a, a story that just that doesn't help it. Uh, and cell phones, obviously, and, they know where you make. Oh cell yeah, phone get rid Just of today, them. there was a story. <laughs> about, uh, there was a story about Dan Twitter um, selling. Um, <laughs> Uh, streams of, of Twitter uh, data on where what people have been saying on Twitter to um, uh, all sorts of uh, third parties who are interested in you know say what are what is what are people on Twitter saying about uh, say a particular company for example so uh, it's a it's a it's it's an interesting issue where you think you're you're doing one thing when you're making say a particular comment uh, even beyond you know the obvious things of obviously financial data uh, but there are other kinds of implications too that are interesting. Yeah, I can, I, I can tell you about a, a, an interesting student project, which is trying to explore this, not from the point of view of opting out, but, you know, uh, saying that, you know, is there a way you can avoid it? And what they created was a map of surveillance cameras in New York, and you can map from point A to point B the path of least surveillance. And uh, so there may be an emerging market for, uh, for that as well. Yeah, so it's, uh, well, you know, it, it's interesting as you, you, know, you, you see, um, Almost every time there's some major, um, uh, you know, tragic accident of some kind, plane crashes, uh, car crashes. It seems that there's almost always either a security camera or someone's been filming just happen right. by happenstance. So, uh, your ability to avoid uh, avoid that is uh, is getting smaller and, and smaller every time. So, what about the? the oh, that one. Let me wait to the one Hi, fascinating discussion. I'm Karthik Kavihari. One question, the discussion today has been a lot about the explosion of data. Um, I'd like to ask a question on a related topic, which is the fragmentation of data, and go back to Gordon's statement, if digital memory becomes main memory, and human memory is pointers and uh -huh. metadata, what do we do when the data is so fragmented that our pointers can't track it anymore? 
Um, as an example, I have files on my server, on my right. email, in Gmail, three computers at home, uh, Facebook, and it's continuing to explode. So how do we yeah. make sense of <coughs> finding what we want when we want it? Are there any technology solutions today? Or that's a good startup, I think. And <laughs> uh, you know, and and I know that's one of the things called the unified store that uh, Microsoft. Bill talks about that. Has talked about that for ten or twenty years, and I, and I, and finally I understand what it is now. Namely, it's it's that problem of what you know. I'm calling it where the hell is my data uh, problem. Well, I think this gets a little bit at something you were talking about before, Guido, which is that the data shouldn't live on your laptop or your desktop or uh, you know or on your handheld device. The data belongs someplace in the cloud where the actual physical location may not matter so much. You're shaking your head now. Uh, I'll say the data is where it is. It's, yes. It's not it well, I think where it isn't, it's just where it is. There are right. two questions. Where is it going to be versus where should it be? Well, should, is, should is a... I think my, my point is it should be in the cloud. I mean, I have a lot of data stored locally, but typically, I think pretty much all of it, uh, backup in the cloud exists. And I think, I mean, to the, I think the search question that you're raising is, is very hard. Right? I think what, what I really want is a unified search interface to all my data, no matter where it sits. Right. Right? And currently, I have that you know, for those mm -hmm. whatever five out of 89 services, right? <laughs> which is very frustrating. Uh, and something like Mint obviously helps a little bit, because that now, I think that was the first time, Mint was the first time I had sort of a unified access to all my financial services, you know, which, which was you know, before that, figuring out how much did we spend on a certain thing last month was you know, a major exercise. Now, suddenly, you can easily do that. I mean, the, I think the next thing what I'd like to have is basically a desktop plugin for Mint that would basically hook this up to my desktop search, so I could you know, use then yeah. an aggregator like that to, to search for my financial data. And so, I mean, I don't know how this will evolve, you know, I, I, but I think long term, we'll see some kind of search access to, to these different, you know, silos. Yes, in the front. Uh, back to a tangent. Uh, I've just seen a few things recently about when someone dies, what happens to their email account, and all this knowledge storage uh, that goes along with that in, in the context that you guys are speaking of. Do you think we have to like? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you have any thoughts on that? Are there, I mean, just knowing that, are there, I don't know what, are there rules that apply? Are there, there are, are there regulations that apply? What happens to your data? And it's not just through data, well, um, when you not just your email account, but what no, happens it's to your it, I think it's more, that, that's an easier one for what happens to your email as an individual because you've got a Gmail account or whatever and it, eh, it goes away or, or somebody picks it up or what. But the other one is more serious of try leaving a company. Now what, ha what happens to your email account? I, uh, Jim Gray and I, uh, and I, Jim started the lab and I worked with him for till, till he left us. You know, we, we both uh, believed in the sort of one brain problem. I mean, you know, we, we can we only handle this one computer in terms of there's so much, so much personal traffic, so much, uh, you know, uh, just li living, dealing with life. Uh, and then also there's this company on the side that you're, you know, you've got uh, about 10 times more traffic going there. And so all of our, all of my stuff is in one file. I mean, one in, is an outlook, and uh, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, I know what happened uh, with Jim um, because the company owns that, basically owns that data, and I really I believe that they, you know, they have rights to it. And so whether we talk about that a little bit in the book about, you know, you you have to expunge your memory. Basically, you you have a lobotomy basically on certain things if they if a lobotomy. It's very hard to give a lobotomy sometimes because while you're on a program committee for the company and it's part, you know and, and you're interacting with people that are outside of the company stuff stuff like that. So what's your professional life? And in the, in this one of the organizing principles in the in the book and actually in my life bits is the idea of parallel lives, lifelines, and this this corresponds to the notion that I am I I. Am, Quote, invented the word, word life. You know, as a good engineer, uh, didn't read anything. Uh, but at the same time, the psychologists were inventing the same thing in about 2000, which was the concept of the autobiographical memories. So that's an organizing principle. I, 
one of those lights, I, you saw slices of life there, and I've got, you know, maybe a hundred or so, I was involved with maybe a hundred startups, and each of those, in a sense, have a life by themselves, and so our organizing principle is life, and all those lives, in a sense, when you, those conversations and things are a part of, if you really got into the privacy stuff, they would all be, those lives and those conversations are all owned by somebody else, or jointly, they're usually jointly owned. Like we're uh, getting yeah. close on time. We'll do one more question. Actually, this is more of a comment than a question. I'm in the security space a lot, and I just wanted to say two things. Um, one, you're talking about constructing your own life. Uh, my feeling is as good as my feeling is um, the world is constructed for you. For example, I see that right now we're deploying 50 million cameras in the world worldwide, 250 million cameras a year. It's this fast exploding every place. We we kind of have to deploy like your target deploy 500 cameras. Cities like Anaheim deploying 3,000 cameras. There's cameras everywhere, and we're helping people to track and record them. And so what I'm I'm seeing that is without without our understanding, you know, we record faces, we record license plate, record activities. In our project with the National Lab right now, they want to record as soon as you come in, record everything you do because they think they own you. So they have records right now of where you've been, what you did, which hall you walked, where you parked the car. That is being done on a pilot project at the National Lab. And, and so they have a complete life of your know, eight to five life mm -hmm. because they think they own you. My point is that uh, without you recording yourself, I think the world is recording you uh, very right. really fast. Yeah. And it probably will happen in about 10 years time because I'm, I'm in the space, I can see, I pretty much, it's kind of scary what's happening right now and some of the projects in the intelligence space and something. Secondly, that kind of brings to the point you talked about uh, privacy. I was very strong proponent of privacy myself. Right now my feeling is what privacy doesn't exist anymore. And you just kind of, we are kind of slowly losing privacy without we knowing it. And we can protest right now, we can demand it. You kind of slowly lose, you know, 10, 20 years. I don't think we'll have much privacy at all. I think we all are digital slaves. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Uh, could you do one great note? Uh, note. Uh, we have a happy comment. <laughs> <laughs> That's too grim to end on that note. Yeah, we have one up here. <laughs> happy. Hello. The issue, uh, Sandy Klausner with Core Talk. The uh, issue appears to be we're creating all this data. And uh, it seems to be that we're swimming in all this data, and we can't find it. And uh, about 10 years ago, Tim Berners-Lee came up with the uh, original Scientific America article on the semantic web. And here we are 10 years later, and it looks like we're still waiting for the semantic web to happen. Um, what are your thoughts regarding the, the dream of the semantic web and where it is and where do you think it's going? That sounds like its own panel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We think in keywords. People have been trained to think in keywords. I think Semantic Web was meant to be a tool for people to learn how to interact with technology. And the fact is, we've evolved our cultural interaction with technology to accommodate, accommodate it and pull it forward. And I think that's why you look at Ask Jeeves, why Ask Jeeves ended up in a technology cul-de-sac. Um, and I think that the semantic web is not something that appeals to the younger generation as much as it does to the older generation that's taking some time to become comfortable with technology, but that's one person's opinion. And I think there are projects where, you know, things like Open Mind, which try to infer these links from the natural utterances, you know, akin to what you're saying. I mean, the, the way we talk, the way we speak, the way we write, there's a certain, you know, you know uh, things you can deduce from there which are not AI but nevertheless can help understand the connections and linkages between things. Those efforts seem to be uh, uh, also succeeding in parallel mess because it's unclear to me, and you know, I agree, if we are going to have this proliferation of people uh, knowledge encoding their data, uh, it would certainly be a benefit to do so, but the motivation has to be high, and it's unclear, I agree, it's unclear that if, uh, if that motivation will, uh, threshold will uh, will go high enough for most people. It's, hey, it's being used in, uh, in a number of applications uh, in various parts of the, 
a medic a medicine when there is a an encoding of of all of the uh, all of the drugs, and so that the computer does know what's being said and what when you when it writes when you write something, you, uh, there's a, a lot of knowledge about that. And but that's being done. done it takes it's a very slow process because. Uh, all of those, you have to build taxonomies and structures for all of that knowledge. Uh, and people think they can do it for me medicine. Uh, we, and we, w we spent two years working on, kind of on this problem, and then in a way, gave, we've got mechanisms in there for uh, describing the data, uh, you know, whether it's keywords or, or just annotations, uh, random annotations, uh, or taking something that's a collection and, and making a higher, another file system that has, or another folder file system that's a, a, an independent system. Uh, and if you really, and then uh, the concept of uh, facets, uh, you know, I got up a year on facets. I thought facets are the greatest thing ever as a taxonomist. I like, I like, I love them. But they're a bear to sort of make good, you know, fat. It, there's an art form in doing that, just as in the semantic web, the semantics has that, has that property. It, it takes groups of things, uh, and groups just don't do. So, folksonomies, uh, you know, this word folksonomy appeared a couple of years ago when that's, that's the keywords that we're going to use, and everybody goes in there and they kind of converge on a set of uh, labels for, for stuff. So, I think semantic web is gradually going to happen in very selected. Things uh, in areas of manufacturing and